On Monday, the 2nd of May, 1842, a vast procession wound its way through the streets of London toward Westminster. With seven bands, including grenadier guardsmen, marshals on horseback, hundreds of banners and countless flags, the spectacle drew a crowd of some 50,000 onlookers. The purpose of the march was to present the second Chartist petition to Parliament, calling for its reform in accordance with the six points of the 1838 People's Charter. Carried by a relay of London tradesmen, the petitioners had planned to convey the 300 kilogram roll of paper directly to the floor of the chamber of the House of Commons. When the Chartists reached the members' entrance, however, the petition became wedged in the doorway and had to be disassembled and heaped on the floor, dwarfing the clerk's table. The six mile long Leviathan petition, as it became known, contained 3.3 million signatures, more than two and a half times the number in the first Chartist petition in 1839. This equated to a third of the adult population and three and a half times the size of the electorate, those eligible to vote. The next day, MPs debated a motion to allow six Chartists to speak at the bar of the House. Thomas Lingsbury Duncombe, who had stage managed the presentation of the petition, had implored parliamentarians. You may think many of their arguments absurd, but do not decide against them without hearing them. The motion was defeated by 287 votes to 49. Why did 287 MPs choose to ignore the will of three million citizens? And what then was the point in petitioning Parliament? One of the main obstacles to the Chartists obtaining their goals was the personal vested interest of MPs in maintaining the status quo. Almost half of members could trace their descent from a titled family within two generations, and the majority were wealthy landowners. Many feared a more representative House of Commons would pass laws detrimental to their interests and had little interest in sharing power with working-class MPs or having to compete for working-class votes. For the majority of the MPs, it was also too soon to change the electoral system. Only four general elections had taken place since the major overhaul of the political system under the 1832 Reform Act. That reform had created a franchise, the right to vote, firmly based upon the ownership or occupation of property, with the aim being to limit the electorate to respectable voters. This was a far cry from the universal male suffrage demanded by the Chartists. Many MPs also felt that the working classes were not ready to be given the vote, some believing that they were too uneducated or ill-informed to exercise the vote wisely. This thinking led to some quite alarmist predictions as to what the consequences of universal male suffrage might be. Thomas Babington Macaulay, in the debate regarding the Charter on the 3rd of May, stated, I believe that universal suffrage would be fatal to all purposes for which government exists. It is utterly incompatible with the very existence of civilization. A parliament thus elected, he predicted, would pass laws which would cause a depression, if not an utter stoppage of trade, famine and pestilence, and ultimately some strong military despot to arise to provide some security to the property which may remain. Disregarding the peaceful nature in which the petition had been presented, some MPs looked back to past incidents of Chartist violence like the Newport Rising and argued that to give in to Chartist demands now risked setting a dangerous precedent in which strikes and riots would be regarded as an effective way to change government policy. With very few members of parliament willing to listen or give voice to their message, the Chartists were arguably doomed to fail. One Chartist supporter remarked that no one who signed the petition ever thought for one moment that the legislature would grant the Charter. And Fergus O'Connor, one of the Chartist leaders, said himself that a million petitions would not dislodge a single troop of dragoons. What then was the point of the petition? As William Beasley told the National Chartist Convention earlier that year, if it made no impression on that house, it would make a great impression on the country. The task of collecting signatures 
galvanized localities and evangelized the Chartist cause. As O'Connor told his fellow Chartists after the petition was rejected, Monday the 2nd of May was a victory for the Chartists, for they alone could muster the forces on display. Be not intimidated. Be not downhearted. <laughs> <laughs>